If you're a guest, welcome. My name is Alex. I'm the pastor of Cascades, and our heartbeat is to help lead people become fully devoted followers of Jesus and his way. Uh, Today is uh, Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday celebrates God sending his spirit to his people to dwell, empower, and unite them. And today we're going to look back and celebrate something that happened in in the church, the big uh, C church, the global church. And as we look back, we're going to see how God intends to empower us with his presence. We're going to read parts of what is found in Acts chapter 2. So if you have a Bible, you can go there. We're going to uh, read parts of it. We're going to summarize some of it too. And then we'll highlight what is happening there. So Acts chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 1. And this is what it says. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a a crowd came together in bewilderment because each heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? If you go on into verse 11, it says, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked each other, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. If you jump down to verse 16, Peter stands up with the 11 other apostles, and in a loud voice, he speaks to the crowd and he explains. He says, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. He goes on to explain about what has happened and the significance of it to the crowd there. And at one point he says, uh, in verse 32, he says, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. He goes on to say, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replies, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. And those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we get to look back at this account of one of the earliest events in the church when you breathed your life into the church and empowered your people and made your home among them. And we ask that this morning, as we uh, try to make sense of this passage, that you would give us wisdom and clarity to hear from you, to understand, and then also to live in light of what it is that you have done. And we pray this for your glory and our joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so uh, the big idea for this morning is, is really that God wants to empower you with his presence. Now, when you read this story, uh, you, you see that one of the key themes here is this idea of This Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's empowering presence. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a force, like in Star Wars, where you like learn the force and you can manipulate the force. It's not like that. The Holy Spirit is not just a power or an influence. The Holy Spirit is God's Spirit. It's not impersonal, it's personal. It's not an it. The Holy Spirit is God's presence who comes to his people and dwells in them, 
individually and corporately, and we see that in this passage. Now, what's Pentecost Sunday? Why is it called Pentecost? And what made it so significant? Well, Pentecost was a Jewish harvest festival. There were three harvest festivals that Israel celebrated, and this was one of them. And this is one where faithful Jews from all over the Greco-Roman world would make this pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and they would bring their gifts and offerings to the Lord. And a, a picture something like wherever you have the Olympics, where all these people come from all over the place for this one thing. Now, this isn't for sports in our case. They're here instead to celebrate the goodness of God. Pentecost literally means 50. The festival um, gained this name because it was 50 days after the Passover. And the Passover was this other uh, time where God's people celebrated how God rescued them out of slavery in Egypt and brought them into relationship with him. Now, along the way, Pentecost began to be observed also as the anniversary of God giving his law to Israel. And one of the reasons they did this was because they thought that the receiving of the law came something like 50 days after the Exodus. So that's what's going on here. That's why all these people are in this place who speak these different languages. Um, this event was really them celebrating and responding to God's rescuing and provision by worshiping him with their gifts and offerings in Jerusalem. So that was then, but then today, and what we just read, something else happens on this day that is significant. God gave his people a new gift. God gives his spirit. That's what Pentecost celebrates, that God poured out his spirit upon his people. Jesus, in the very beginning of the book of Acts, he tells his disciples in Acts uh, chapter 1, verse 4, he says, don't depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. And he goes on to say, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Then he goes on to tell them in verse 8, it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. On Pentecost Sunday, the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus' first disciples. And this is what makes this day so significant. This is what we get to look back on and rejoice in and celebrate, that the Holy Spirit has come. It's not an understatement to say that this event changed the world forever. That the calling that you and I have as followers of Jesus is impossible apart from the Father and the Son sending the Spirit. John Stott will say, without the Holy Spirit, the Christian, Christian discipleship would be inconceivable, even impossible. There can be no life without the life giver, no understanding without the spirit of truth, no fellowship without the unity of the spirit, no Christ-likeness of character without his power. As a body without breath is a corpse, so the church without the spirit is dead. Pentecost is the day that God breathed his very life into his new humanity. And that's what causes us to rejoice. And so what I want to look at is three things that are taking place on Pentecost Sunday. They are this. God sent his spirit to dwell within us. God sent his spirit to empower us to be his witnesses or to make Jesus known. God sent his spirit to unite us under the banner of Jesus. So let's look at this first one. It's only been five minutes and my throat's already itchy. I don't know what's happening. <clears throat> Okay, God sent his spirit to dwell within us. When Luke, who's the writer of this book, he, he starts this chapter, he says, look, a sound like a blowing of, viol of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them, and all of them were filled with the spirit. Wind and fire, were, they were these, they're were these common symbols for the spirit of God throughout the Bible. In fact, in Greek and Hebrew, the word for spirit is the same as wind. In Ezekiel 37 uh, and in John 3, they make reference to the wind or breath of God. In Genesis 1, we read of how God breathes the very, his very life into humanity. And, and now, in this story, we see how God's very breath is what animates his new humanity, the church. Fire was also a symbol for God's presence and power, the clearest example of this is found in Exodus 3, when God appears to Moses in the burning bush, or when God leads Israel with this pillar of fire in Exodus 13. What becomes significant is that the Holy Spirit doesn't simply, though, come among 
God's people, though he does that. He doesn't just rest on them, though he does that. Verse 4 says that all of them are filled with the presence of God. And this is a fulfillment of what God promised he would do in Ezekiel 36. He says to them that one day, a day would come when he would make a new covenant, a new uh, agreement with them, where I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. In other words, God's saying, there's a day that is coming when I'm going to give you a new heart, a living heart, not a heart that is hard like stone towards me or others, but one that is alive and tender to me and others, tender to my ways. How? Well, I'm going to give you a new spirit, and the new spirit I'm going to put in you is my spirit, the very presence of God in you. And with my spirit, you will live Sin kills, sin distorts, sin alienates you from me and you from others. But my spirit, God's spirit, it brings life. His spirit restores. His spirit brings wholeness and peace to all of our relationships. See, the indwelling of God's spirit is his means of renewing and restoring our human nature. And on Pentecost, that happened. That day that was promised arrived. It took place. God's Holy Spirit comes and begins to make his home in your heart. And here's why this matters. Apart from the gift of God's Spirit, your heart cannot change. Your heart is the fulcrum of who you are. It is the control center of your desires, your thoughts, your will. But Pentecost, it teaches us that hearts apart from the renewing and restoring work of God's Spirit are cold, numb, and resistant to his will. It teaches us that we need his spirit because apart from him, our hearts are fickle. One moment we want to do his will, then the next we're moved to do something else, that the next thing, whatever that is, that keeps our attention. But because of God, because he sent the gift of the spirit to dwell in us, God has made us alive, and he's given us a new heart with new desires, and he doesn't force his way upon us. He prompts us. He makes us aware. He invites us and directs us to do what is good and to reveal him to others. And as God dwells in us, his presence animates and lightens our hearts so that what comes out of our hearts isn't like a sewer, but instead like the stream of living water that is pure and good. What comes out of our hearts are the things that of God, love for others, love for him, kindness, sacrificial generosity, faith. What wants to come out of your heart is this goodness. So instead of judgment, you actually want to look upon others with mercy. And instead of harboring bitterness, you want to extend forgiveness. God's Holy Spirit is how he will renew and restore our human nature. It's his method for renewing our hearts. And if you trust in Jesus as king, as redeemer of your sin, God's made his dwelling in you. If you have God's Spirit in you, He's made you alive. He's given you a new heart with new desires. And one of the outworkings of that, we're told in Acts 2, is actually that you end up declaring the wonders of God. Now, it sounds really fancy, but when the Spirit of God comes and God pours His love into your, our hearts, we declare what He has done for us, what He has done in our world. You can't help but sing to him, to thank him, to call others to do it. It's this response of enjoying his presence. On Pentecost, God sent his spirit to dwell within us, and he sent his spirit to empower us to make him known. In vo verse 4, we read that all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The first item that we see the Spirit of God do to help his people is actually enable them to make Jesus known. It's what Jesus promised they would have. They did have this power to be his witnesses. But what's astounding is these disciples are not just making Jesus known. They're making Jesus known in other languages. And so people hear, and they're utterly amazed, and they ask, aren't these guys from the Galilee region? How is it that each of us hears them in our own native languages? Back then, the Galilee looked like uh, it was backwards, like it was the boonies, a bunch of hillbillies. They even spoke differently. They had a different dialect than those in Jerusalem. 
Galilee wasn't seen as this place of influence or power. But Jesus' first disciples came from Galilee. So they're in Jerusalem and their accents sound different. And yet here they are making the wonders of God known to these people from all these other places. They're proclaiming Jesus and what he had done in languages they hadn't stu uh, studied or learned. And it's this supernatural empowering. And it's different than tongues that we read about elsewhere in the New Testament, like in 1 Corinthians 12. Luke's point isn't to say that this speaking another language to make Jesus known like this is a normative thing for his people. His point is highlighting what happens when the Spirit of God comes. You receive power to make Jesus known. Peter and his disciples were fearful men. They hid. They, were, they denied knowing him. Peter did this three times, and then he becomes this courageous leader who calls out his own people, and he says, you guys are the reason Jesus was unjustly killed. You need to turn and repent from that. Receive the Holy Spirit. And that day, 3,000 people do that. They come to Jesus in faith. People are wondering, what kind of Galileans are these? What kind of people are these? These are ones empowered by the very Spirit of God. God has this way of subverting the historical power structures, and he uses the lowly or marginalized, the unexpected, sometimes hillbillies, to be part of his powerful move of redemption on Pentecost Sunday. And we need to be reminded of this when we read this, that these guys were not bold and courageous to start with. That's not who they were. Something happened to them that transformed them. Sometimes we live as if we do not need the Spirit or as if we don't have the Spirit of God dwelling in us. We live not having to depend on God's empowerment or even asking for his help for the majority of our lives. Everything you do, you can do in your own power, in your own strength, with no thought of how the Lord would or can help or lead you if you would just surrender and ask him. It highlights this arrogance at work in our hearts. And the end result is that we are tired, stressed, and we lack joy. You're not getting to experience what God wants to do in you and through you by depending on his spirit. And if you're living a life that doesn't depend on his power, then you're not actually living the life God intended for you. On the other hand, some of us live as if we just don't have the spirit. So we've actually like lived in fear. Some of us might struggle with this pride or arrogance. Others might, it might be fear. We don't believe that God actually has given us power to actually make Jesus known in our lives. So we don't step out in faith. We don't depend on God, not because of arrogance, but because we actually don't believe he'll give us what we need. So we abdicate our positions as Jesus' ambassadors. We surrender our privilege to be part of advancing his kingdom. We forfeit this opportunity to have Jesus revealed through our dependence on him. The book of Acts consistently hits on these two ideas, that his disciples will pray for and ask for boldness to make Jesus known. And then as they do, two things will happen. They'll experience reception and rejection. It's just part of the deal. Some receive and it's amazing. Some reject, sometimes violently. Other times they're just disinterested. Sometimes people scoff and say, you guys are drunk. Whatever it is, there's this pattern where the disciples will pray and ask for boldness and God empowers them. And then as they seek to do it, they actually experience not just success, but sometimes rejection. They don't have control over that part. On this day, on Pentecost Sunday, 3,000 people to come to God. They hear the apostles declaring what God has done for them. They see people respond in faith, and yet there are others who dismiss it and think that Peter and all the other apostles have been drinking at 9 in the morning. If people write it off then on a day when God pours out his Holy Spirit, why wouldn't people write it off today? But even before that, people were drawn into this event. They were at least curious. Because something was outside of the norm was taking place. Something that doesn't fit how they understand life. And it leads them to ask a question, how are they doing this? How can they, in this case, be speaking in our languages? And I think something similar can happen in our lives that can open up an opportunity. Because I'm not saying go and be the obnoxious person in your workplace or in your neighborhood where you just make every single point of conversation somehow bring it back to Jesus. What I'm talking about, though, is like our lives will look different if we seek to follow Jesus. 
And sometimes it can be like the story we looked at last week in the book of Ruth with Naomi, how she suffers and navigates and walks through grief and loss. And Ruth sees it. And Ruth ultimately says, your God will be my God. But there's something that happens before that where you observe there's something different about the way you live. I think as we live devoted to Jesus, as we seek to depend on God's Spirit, as we embrace the way of Jesus for our lives, it's going to look different than other people in our city. The way we carry ourselves, the things we do, how we spend our weekends, how we spend our money, what we treasure most should look different. And rather than avoid that difference, we should acknowledge it, be open to the questions and conversations that might come up because of these differences. Because God's Spirit has been poured out, He's actually done a work in you, and He longs to do a beautiful work in those around you. So if someone asked you why you follow Jesus, could you answer that question? Like if they just put you on the spot today, would you be able to just say why? What happened in your life that led you to that place? What would it look like to share a part? Maybe not all. I mean, it's not like they're going to ask you, say, okay, tell me in a, in a half hour. I'll give you this 30 minutes. It's probably going to be like a 10-second answer. What are you going to say? What would it look like to share part of what God has done for you in your life? Or maybe share themes of your story that convey God's goodness and his saving love. It might actually be something more specific. Why do you pray? See, your job, our job, is not to save people. He doesn't empower you to save people. He empowers you to be a faithful witness of who he is and what he's done. Sometimes you'll get just a few seconds. Sometimes you won't get that opportunity. You don't get, that, you don't get to control the outcome. But you do get to control how you're going to live, how you're going to respond. And you don't do this alone. God's very presence dwells in you and empowers you to do this. He sends his spirit to dwell in us. He sends his spirit to empower us to make Jesus known. And thirdly, he sends his spirit to unite us under the banner of Jesus. On Pentecost, Jews from all over the Roman Empire were there in Jerusalem, and the spirit of God en enabled them to speak in these other languages that these people could understand. 3,000 people come to Jesus, and they're united under the banner of Jesus. Then they would go back home, where they live, in other parts of the empire, carrying that same Jesus, declaring that he was Lord, the Messiah, the Savior, and sharing it with their family. And yet this is a hint to what's going to happen in the rest of the story in Acts 10, when the Spirit of God doesn't just move amongst Jews, but against Gentiles, all non-Jews, welcoming them into the family of God. God's Holy Spirit was beginning to tear down cultural disharmony. He was beginning to address this ethnic strife that is rife in our world. And whenever one has tried to uh, bring about order and unify people, it's led to this kind of subjugation. Most recently, we've seen that as a form of cultural imperialism. And there's this uh, British uh, pastor, his name's Roy Clements. He, he asked this question, is there a power that can unify the divided nations of the earth without subjugating them? Is there a way of making people one without at the same time making them all the same? And his answer is, it is precisely that sort of unity which the Holy Spirit brings. And he declares his intention in the matter right at the beginning, on the day of Pentecost, by the miracle he performed. In order for this to be possible, you need to be able to address all of the hurt, all the wounds, and all the hostility that exists between different groups. And then to legitimate the pain people experience and provide a pathway towards reconciliation and then for healing. And that is made possible through Jesus Christ. Only in Jesus Christ is that made possible. Paul talks about how Jesus does this through the cross. In Ephesians 2, he says, For Jesus himself is our peace. He's right into a community of believers who are both Jewish and Gentiles. And he says, look, Jesus himself is our peace. And he has made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. And his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, 
thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. And then in verse 18 it reads, For through him we both, meaning both groups, now have access to the Father by one spirit. So this unity, this reconciliation, this peace, this access to God is made possible through Jesus' death on the cross. And it is the Spirit of God that empowers this new humanity to live in this unity. The banner that we get brought under is Jesus. His life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. The spirit that now dwells in you and I and among us is the same spirit. It's not that I have a different spirit than you. We've been given the Holy Spirit. Every, people from every tribe, nation will be part of it. And so here's why this matters. Sometimes you might wonder, like, why, why does it even matter that we gather in person? Especially during the pandemic, people are like, well, who cares? It does matter. We are a visible witness to God's victory over that division, over sin, over death, over the enemy. There's these different nations, different ethnicities, different groups, different economic uh, situations going on, but we come together and what unites us is Jesus. His life, his death, his resurrection. We've been given that same spirit. So, our unity is this visible testimony to Jesus' ongoing ministry of making peace between God and humanity and between humanity. And there are a lot of differences in this room. Different ethnicities, different languages, wealth, whatever. But there's even people in here who cheer for the Oilers. And I'm praying that your team doesn't win another game, but also that the Lord would comfort you afterwards. <laughs> we come from different backgrounds, but we have this thing in common. What unites us is that Jesus has redeemed us, that God's Spirit dwells in us, the same Spirit. And so we may have different views because we come from different countries with different cultural views on certain things, different political views even, different economic views. We may have differences in terms of what some of our goals in life are, but what transcends all of that is what we have in common. It's that our allegiance, our commitment, our affection for Jesus and his kingdom are above all those other things. And so we don't say the differences don't exist. They do. They're real. We hold that tension, but we recognize that what we've been given in Jesus is actually greater. It weighs more. And that holds not just this authority, but this kind of like this binding that brought, brings us together. We hold that tension. We elevate Jesus and his way over and above our own way, over and above our own way of even doing church the way we do church here in the West. It looks different in other parts of the world. And in a world that is as polarized as ours, and you just pick whichever topic you want to pick, because it feels like there's so many right now, the peace and the unity that Jesus has established between us testifies to the power of his gospel. It's this living thing when we gather together. It's the visible thing when we take communion and say that he died for me. And I am his and he is mine. But we don't just say it as individuals. We say he died for us. We are his and he is ours. It's this visible thing and it matters. And Pentecost shows us that God sent his spirit to unite us. We declare that victory when we actually maintain the unity that God's spirit established. Where this diverse group of people come together to worship God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
where this witness to this peace is established between, between us and him and each other. And we declare that the living God dwells among us and in us. And so because of that, when we hear God sent his spirit to dwell within us, we can rejoice. We can worship him. We can enjoy him. He's working to transform you, to lead you in his, into more of his life. When we hear God sent his spirit to empower us to make him known, we can live recognizing he's going to give me that power. I can depend on him. He's trustworthy. He's good for it. When we hear God sent his spirit to unite us under the banner of Jesus to live as this new humanity, we can actually ask him to help us walk in step with that reality. See, God doesn't want us to live apart from his spirit. When we live walking in step with the spirit, as Paul will talk about in Galatians 5, you're going to experience God's renewing presence in your life. You will begin to walk in the ways of Jesus. You will become this agent of God's renewing and restorative work in our city, in your relationships around you. Not because it's all on you, but because God's actually enabling you and empowering you to do it. That's why Pentecost Sunday is such a great thing to look back on and give thanks for. So so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take communion, and maybe some of what you've heard today is new. Do you hear about the Spirit of God, and it actually feels new for you. For some of you, it's actually not new. It's something you've heard many times before. Just a refresher. This week, um, one of the, uh, something I've been praying is something I came across as I was studying. It's this very old hymn. It's a prayer uh, called uh, Veni Sancta Spiritus in Latin, or Come Holy Spirit. It's attributed to a guy who lived, um, you know, between, uh, what is it? 1150 A.D. and 1228 A.D. His name was Stephen Langton. He was a, a medieval, medieval theologian. And at one point in this hymn, uh, he, he describes what God's Spirit does. Now, Latin is close to Spanish, so don't come at me, Kenny, for the way that this gets pronounced, okay? But there's a rhythm that we lose when we translate it. So in Latin, it sounds something like lava quod est sordidum, Riga quod est aridum, sana quod est saucium, flecte quod est rigidum, fove quod est frigidum, rehe quod est divium. And there's, it's sung, like I just read it trying to make sure I got it kind of close. But you sing it, and you can go, go wiki it, you can hear how it sounds. But what it's saying is, it's asking the Spirit of God to wash what is dirty to refresh what is dry, to heal what is wounded, to bend what is stubborn, to melt what is frozen, to direct what's wandering or what's gone astray. You know, when I first read it, I was like, shoot, man, I kind of recognize, I resonate with a bunch of these, and I've experienced God's Spirit working, doing these different things at different times in my life where my, I was stubborn and I needed to be bent, just where, where I was wandering and I needed him to, to, to direct, where my heart was like frozen and he was melting it. And initially I wanted to ask, um, what is it that God's Spirit, or what is it that you need God's Spirit to do in you? Maybe you recognize that you need him to refresh, that you need him to heal. But I also sort of think, you know what? God has a desire for us. He knows what he wants to do in us. And so I would just invite you to pray, God, what is it you want to do in me today? And, and before he, you even discern an answer, just say, whatever it is, I say yes to it, Lord. If you want to heal, please heal that. If you want to ref- 